Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, CSML uh, seminar uh, by uh, Guido Montufar. Uh, uh, Guido is an, an assistant professor at the departments of uh, mathematics and uh, statistics at UCLA. And he's also a, pr a principal investigator in the ERC starting grant on deep learning uh, theory at the Max Planck Institute for mathematics and the sciences. Uh, Guido is interested in mathematical uh, machine learning, especially uh, the interplay of model capacity, optimization, and generalization in deep learning. And in current projects, he investigates optimization and regularization strategies uh, for neural networks, information theoretic approaches to learning data representations, information geometric and optical transportation approaches to genetic modeling, and algebraic geometric approaches to graphical models with hidden variables. He has a lot of cool work on um, uh, training in neural networks. Uh, and today he will uh, be presenting his work on implicit bias of grading descent for mean squared error regression with wide neural networks. Um, Guido has agreed to take questions during the talk. So please feel free uh, to interrupt him if, if you have an urgent question. Otherwise, you can just write it in the chat and he would be happy to answer the questions after the talk. Uh, so without further ado, I'll give the, uh, I'll, I'll let Guido uh, start his presentation. Uh, okay, so thank you very much um, for having me and for the kind introduction. Um, yes, so please uh, do feel free to uh, interrupt. And with the chat, I'm going to try to follow the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, if I miss uh, your comments there, just uh, yeah, just interrupt, please. Okay, so this is joint work with Hui Jin, who is one of my students at UCLA. And um, uh, so let's take a look. Um, so what I want to do is, well, okay, give you an introduction to the topic, uh, what we did here, uh, discuss the result, um, if we have enough time, the strategy of the proof. All right, so, <clears throat> so the, the universe in which we are moving here is um, that of the generalization puzzle. So the, the problem here is that, you know, we have these other parameterized neural networks that are trained without explicit regularization, and uh, nonetheless, they generalize well in practice. Uh, the common wisdom in statistical learning theory is that when you have a lot of model capacity, then we're going to be very prone to overfitting. But in practice with neural networks, we don't, we don't quite see that. So there must be um, principles, some type of uh, implicit realization happening. And so in particular, the implicit bias of parameter optimization has been identified to play a key role here. Um, this is a form of capacity control that is different from the network size. I'm going to say more about that. Um, so what we mean by implicit bias is that among the many uh, possible hypotheses or functions that uh, would fit the data and the neural network um, in principle can represent this learning algorithm, um, namely you know, minimizing the training error by following a gradient descent rule, will um, select a hypothesis that satisfies additional properties um, that may end up being beneficial for the performance of this hypothesis on new data, meaning that it will generalize well. So there is a lot of, of recent works on optimization and biases um, of neural network uh, training. I will maybe just mention a few of them, but certainly um, uh, not, 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 not nearly give a, a complete view. Um, all right, so maybe let me you a kind of a geometric picture of the situation that, that I have in mind. So maybe we have here a universe of, um, of functions that can be represented by the neural network. So a neural network um, can express all these functions. And uh, we know that we have uh, many more parameters than data. And so that means we are um, in an underdetermined uh, situation. So, you know, potentially there is going to be many solutions to, to fitting the data. So maybe we have here some kind of a sub-manifold of, um, of functions that fit the data. So fit the data. Um, and this could be, you know, very different functions. So maybe over here, this point uh, corresponds to a function that maybe, so if this is our training data, maybe this function actually fits it like this. Or so, and maybe over here we have um, again maybe our data sitting in there, and the function is is very wild. And over here maybe uh, again, so we have our data, and the function fits it very nice and smoothly. Um, so that's kind of the situation we have. And um, 
Uh, so maybe one possible idea is that you know, when we are running a neural network, we're not just saying, okay, give me a minimizer of the training objective that would mean to feed the data, but you know, we are starting the parameter somewhere. So initialization, and then we're following a, a specific trajectory that is by following the gradient descent um, update. And maybe this will you know, end up hitting this surface at a point that somehow is closest to that initialization. And maybe that, that space of points that are close to the initialization are be nice functions, are gonna be nice functions, be nice functions. And, um, and that's how we, we may expect actually that if we are selecting the hypothesis in the neural network class by following a gradient descent rule, and we're using an adequate or good initialization, and the network has a parametrization that is uh, suitable, then uh, you know that that solution is going to have good uh, good properties. So it's going to um, have a good predictive performance outside of the training data. Um, okay, so much for that. So what we need to do here then is, you know, basically understand what is the trajectory that we are taking there in parameter space and the set of, uh, of parameters that are then close to initialization, what kind of functions do they correspond to? Uh, can we make um, any explicit statements about them? Uh, okay, so for the implicit bias in parameter space, um, so maybe there are a couple of things that, that have been very important in the past couple of years. Maybe one is that the training dynamics of wide neural networks turns out to be well approximated by that of a linear Taylor approximation of the model at a suitable initialization. So that means that you know, if the network is very wide, has many parameters, you, know, you can think of it almost as a linear model. And uh, also uh, this notion that a model can converge to zero training error while hardly varying the parameters. So maybe this is a lazy training. Uh, regime. And uh, so maybe from that perspective, uh, one can imagine that um, you know, one, one is going to be able to say something about the, the, the parameter that is found by optimization. Uh, so in particular, the so gradient descent optimization for um, regression uh, loss uh, with a linearized model will end up hitting a global minimum of the loss function, which is closest to the initialization in parameter space. And um, so, you know, even if the network is not linearized, if you consider the, uh, the actual network, you will also find that in some sense, the parameter uh, at which you converge is gonna be close to the initial parameter. Okay, this is um, so very, very nice and interesting. Um, now, you know, one natural question is how do we interpret those parameters in function space? And, uh, you know, there has been uh, this very interesting work, um, recent work, in particular by Savares and co-authors and Onji and co-authors where what they did was that they were looking at the standard parametrization for a shallow network. And uh, they tried to relate the norm of the parameters um, or the, the, the smallest norm of the parameters that allows you to approximate a particular function arbitrarily well to some properties of that function. And what they found is that uh, the one, the second derivative of a function um, kind of corresponds to uh, corresponds to to what would be the minimum two norm of the parameters uh, that would allow you to represent that function by the neural network. It's something like that. So this is kind of telling us uh, a relationship between um, parameters and properties of the functions. Um, one particular implication of this is that if you were to be doing grand descent with an L2 weight penalty. Uh, so you will end up um, obtaining functions that fit the training data. And simultaneously, they have the smallest one norm of the second derivative. So that's, um, that's this one here. So it's the one norm of the second derivative. So if, you, if you're trying to fit some data while minimizing the one norm of the second derivative, an example of a solution to that problem is a linear interpolating spline. So maybe you have your data points there and you're gonna have a, a solution function that that is linear between those points, uh, something like that. Now, what we want to do is to obtain an interpretable function space description of the solutions that are found by gradient descent training, but without explicit regularization. So we don't want to be penalizing the norm of the. And indeed, that's um, the type of result that we obtain here, namely a description in function space of the implicit bias 
uh, that that happens when we apply gradient descent uh, to regression problems with wide ReLU neural networks. Uh, okay, so any questions so far? Uh, okay, so then let me start with a few definitions. So we are considering a shallow, fully connected fit forward network um, where maybe we have the inputs and you know one hidden layer of width n and a single output. And uh, you know that means for any given input, the output of the network is um, it takes this particular form. So so we have um, a bunch of affine functions of the input. We apply this nonlinearity and then we compute a weighted sum of those. And uh, we are focusing here on ReLU, but I'm going to say a bit more about possible generalizations later on. Now we are collecting all these parameters W and B, which are the biases into this uh, theta. Um, okay, so in the case that we had a single input, so then we would have a single weight for um, every one of the hidden neurons or every one of these functions and, and also an output weight. So W wouldn't be a vector of dimension D, but just, um, uh, just a number. Uh, okay, so then uh, as I was telling you, so the parameter initialization is, is very important. So, and the, the way we are thinking about this is we, we are taking independent samples of pre-specified random variables, W and B, the following way. So we have here these random variables, W and B, and uh, we sample them and we, we scale them by this uh, coefficient that so the number of, um, of, of units that are um, feeding into um, into the particular unit. Uh, so if we have the inputs, then we would be scaling by one over the square root of D. And for the output layer, we have N units in the output in the hidden layer. So we scale by the square root of one over N. Um, okay, so that's um, maybe what, what is known as the standard parametrization. In some other cases, so we are thinking of all of these things as a trainable parameter. In some other cases, you may just, you know, initialize in the same way, but only train this guy here and have this as a fixed parameter outside of the of training parameter. And that's something different. So, but we're focusing here on the case where this whole thing is trainable. Um, and here, more generally, uh, we, we also actually allow um, to have weight biases uh, sample as pairs from, um, from a, a, a probability vector that has a sub-Gaussian joint distribution. So it's a slightly more general setting, um, which encompasses, uh, for instance, it, you know, the typical traditional works where W and B are Gaussians and the samples are just IID, or also the default initialization in PyTorch where W and B are uniform from some interval. Um, okay, so, so much for that. So we are looking at a regression problem. So we have a, a data set of, of pairs, so X and, and Y, and uh, we have the empirical risk um, where we were summing the loss of our prediction against the actual value y that we have in the training data. And for this loss, we're using the square error. So, you know, this, the, the square norm of the difference between our prediction and the value that we had in the data. And we're using here full batch rate in descent uh, with a fixed learning rate eta to minimize this uh, empirical uh, risk. Uh, so this means that we're defining an iteration of parameters. Theta t plus one is equal to theta t minus eta times the gradient of the empirical risk. And you know this is you know, some you can write it in different ways. And um, yeah, so so but you know this is fairly standard. Uh, maybe the only thing to point out here is you know we're looking at a fixed learning rate and we're doing full batch gradient descent, square error. Um, all right, uh, so, so much for this introduction. And now I want to uh, tell you about uh, our result and some of the implications. Uh, okay, so let's see. So this is the first part and um, then I'm gonna show you the second part. Maybe the first part is kind of uh, already well known or well documented in the literature. Nonetheless, I, I, I will um, maybe spend uh, one minute uh, walking you through it. Um, so we consider a feedforward network with a single input. I'm gonna say some more about the generalization later on. Um, a single hidden layer with n relus and a single output unit. Uh, 
Now we assume the standard parametrization that I just showed you. And for each of the hidden units, we assume that the bias are initialized from a sub Gaussian uh, joint probability distribution for the weight and the bias, which has a joint density. And um, then uh, for any finite data set and a sufficiently large N, so the width of the network, there will exist some constants U and V so that the optimization of the mean square error on this data set by full batch gradient descent with sufficiently small uh, step size will converge to a parameter theta star. So you're saying gradient descent converges to some parameter. And for that parameter, the function that we get actually attains zero training error. Uh, all right. And uh, moreover, the implicit bias description, uh, we have that this function, uh, that's the function we converge to, f of theta star, is uh, close to another function g star. And it is close in the sense that if we take the, the, the two norm over some domain for those two functions, then uh, that there is gonna be less than one over square root n, the width of the network. So as the network gets wider, the difference of these two functions gets smaller. Uh, now, what is that function G star? Um, the function G star is gonna be the solution to a variational problem. And um, this is the problem here. So let's take a look. So we have a function G that uh, first of all, it fits the training data. And second of all, it minimizes some kind of energy, this thing over here. And uh, this energy is expressed in terms of the second derivative for that function. And uh, actually we're looking here at the square of the second derivative relative to the initial function. So we have uh, the initial functions f, f theta zero, that's the function at initialization. So we look at the difference um, to that function, take the second derivative and take the square. And now we want to minimize that value over some domain, well, over the domain, we're trying to minimize that. And this domain is weighted, is weighted by a function one over zeta. And zeta is, um, uh, is a function that takes this particular form here. Now you, what is interesting about zeta is that it is a function that is expressed solely in terms of the joint probability distribution um, uh, with which we initialize the parameters of the network. So if you, rec you will recall, so PWB is the probability distribution that we use to initialize weights and biases. So we are computing something here um, based on that probability distribution. And uh, that ends up determining uh, how much weight we assign to the different parts of the domain in which we want to, to have a small square of the second derivative relative to the initial function. Uh, what else? Okay, so this holds with a high probability over the random initialization, theta zero. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides uh, interpreting this and, uh, you know, and discussing some implications. Okay, maybe first an illustration. Um, so in this figure, uh, what you see is the uniform error between this function G star, that is the solution to our variational problem and the solution of training a neural network. So that's F of theta star. And uh, in the X axis, you see the number of neurons. So as the network gets uh, wider and on the Y axis, you see you know, the difference between these two functions. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so, the, the L2 distance um, between these two functions. Um, okay, so, and we see that, you know, the error um, is decreasing. So this is a logarithmic scale. So um, it's decreasing roughly as one over the square root of the number of neurons, which is, you know, exactly the type of bound that would be the theorem. Um, so that, that's the orange line and the blue line is just the experimental result. And here in the inset, what you see is, you know, kind of this a tiny example, but so the training data here are those five data points, those five dots. And uh, now dimensional input space, and, you know, we train the neural network uh, for N hidden neurons. We're gonna get as a solution, this curve, uh, this line is, uh, you know, it looks like a linear spline interpolating the data. And if we solve the variational problem, we get this uh, orange curve that is kind of a smooth curve 
that also interpolates those data points. As we increase the number of, of here neurons, um, you know, these two curves are very, very close to each other. So that means the solution found by grain descent optimization with the neural network is indeed very closely uh, approximated by the solution to the variational problem. And, you know, that's exactly what we observe here in this line. As the number of neurons gets bigger, maybe 1,000, you, you wouldn't even notice the, the difference between those two curves. It would be, for all practical matters, um, the same. Um, okay, so this is for a particular... I have a yeah. question actually about the, uh, the slide. Uh, so in, in, the, in the small figures you have, uh, it, do you plot? So the blue line, is that uh, for the initial parameter or after convergence? That's after training. Right. Yeah. So at initialization, the curves will be uh, will look something like you know when you initialize the neural network at random, you're gonna get some some function something like that. Um, it's, it's some random function. It doesn't have anything to do with the training. Yeah. So uh, later I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, this this particular trick called asymmetric imitation, um, by which you can ensure that the initial function is gonna take value zero identically. And um, you know that can be useful to reduce um, biases, uh, but I'm going to say some more about that uh, later on. So you know, uh, but so so in, in a way, so if, if you do a random, um, if you take a random parameter, then the initial function is going to look like that. And um, there is a particular trick to still retain some randomness of features, but still get a zero function. You essentially, duplicate the network and subtract it itself. And so you know, to get a zero function. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so so this, you know, yeah, this this would be a trained trained functions. Yeah. <clears throat> so I bet, you know, maybe one way of interpreting this as well is that if you have very few neurons, like let's say in the extreme case, let's say you have a single hidden neuron for a ReLU network. So then you can only express functions that look like this. So the best that you could do will only have two two linear pieces. So you cannot possibly get something that looks smooth. Uh, if you have 10 neurons, you're also gonna get just, you know, maybe 10 pieces or maybe 11 pieces. So whatever function is gonna have only a very small number of, of linear pieces and it's not gonna look smooth. But for 640 neurons, you know, the, the curve already looks, you know, practically smooth. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, Yes, you know the essence of this is just to say that you know we have a we have a variational problem whose solution characterizes very accurately the solution of grain descent optimization of of the neural network. Um, but yeah, and you know the accuracy of this approximation is increasing with the size of the network. Okay, this is another example. It's basically the same thing, just bigger data set. You know, it's still a tiny data set, but still, you know, like it's just saying that. You know, uh, over here, uh, you see we have more points and, you know, also the two cores end up looking very similar to each other as the network increases in here. So the, the error between the variational solution and the neural network training solution are, are, are basically the same. Um, okay, so now I want to discuss um, some of the effect of this curvature penalty function. So this function zeta. Um, about it. So what does it mean that we're trying to minimize the second derivative of a function? The second derivative is something that we associate with the curvature. And um, well, we are trying to minimize the square of the second derivative, but it is weighted over the input space. And so those parts of the input space where we have a high weight, that means we don't want them, the function to have any curvature over there. And um, those parts of the input space where our weight is very small, we are saying, you know, we, we are allowing this function to have more curvature if, if need be. So in this year, I am showing, you know, three different values of that function zeta. Uh, one is flat. Let's look at the green curve is the flat. And if we look at the corresponding solution of the variational problem, we see that's a curve, the green curve here looks, uh, you know, is, is kind of smooth and looks everywhere kind of the same. But if we were to be looking now at this one, the orange, so this is, um, you know, we have a weight curvature, uh, excuse me, a curvature penalty that is highly picked uh, around zero. And if we look at the solution around zero, 
so these are reciprocal curvature penalties just set and not one over set. Huh? So that means that uh, around zero, we would expect that the solution is allowed to use more curvature. And indeed, we see here that the solution here has a higher curvature. And uh, on the other hand, that orange curve in this part of the input space is lower. So we are expecting that the solution function will have a lower curvature over there. And indeed, if we look at the solution here, we know that it has to fit the data because that's the train, uh, but it also you know, should try to minimize the curvature. And indeed the, the orange curve here looks almost linear. So that's, that's kind of a, you know, maybe the, the, the interpretation you know, of what, um, right. So, you know, in turn, so we can interpret this function set as a curvature penalty function. And, uh, you know, I, so we are kind of penalizing the curvature of the difference from initialization. But as I already mentioned, if we use asymmetric initialization, the initial function is zero. And that would mean that we would be looking at the actual solution function and what is the curvature of that solution function. Uh, all right, so what are these functions here? I didn't pull them out of thin air. Those are actually the curvature penalty functions that emerge for different parameter initialization procedures. So the green one, no, but I'm gonna show you a, a kind of a theorem for that. So I told you that this function can be expressed in terms of the probability function or the probability distribution that we use to initialize the parameters. And we can actually solve it uh, exactly. So it's a, a bit of a recap of what I showed you in the theorem. So this function zeta takes this particular form. And um, maybe one thing that I can highlight here is that um, maybe as an intuition, so is that if you look at um, maybe at this, 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 this is the form that I showed you before, but you can look at this equivalent expression. So we have here something like a second moment of the weight uh, conditional on C take x. And what is C is gonna be, uh, is a random variable. And we're taking here the expectation with respect to C. Uh, and that variable is uh, minus W. And in a ReLU, uh, what that corresponds to is that is the, so you imagine we have WX uh, plus B. So um, we're thinking of a ReLU here. So, the, the kink of the ReLU is gonna be sitting at the location uh, where uh, X is equal to minus B divided by W. So that's kind of a, that's a, uh, you can call this a breakpoint. And uh, so we're looking here at the density of breakpoints over the input space. And we're taking here the second moment of the weights um, at the different breakpoint locations. So if you think about it at initialization, of relus um, that you know have their breakpoints at different locations, and you, you have a high density of breakpoints, and the kind of the variance of the weight distribution is high at those values of the breakpoint. You can expect that the the function has a lot of mm, flexibility and can implement a lot of curvature, and so that, that's how this comes about. If you didn't have any breakpoints at some piece of the input space, then you cannot possibly implement curvature there because you know, your function is gonna be linear, at least you know, um, intuitively speaking. Uh, all right, so then as it turns out, you know, we can calculate this function um, explicitly for several standard initialization procedures. So in particular, if we have a Gaussian initialization, say, you know, like so, then uh, this function zeta turns out to have this particular shape and uh, which depends on the variance of the weight uh, distribution and the bias distribution and, and, and so on. Similarly, at a binary uniform initialization uh, where maybe the weights are binary and the biases are uniform in some interval, then we can, we can compare that and see that it is actually uniform in some interval. And also for the uniform initialization, uh, this zeta turns out to be uniform on, on a corresponding interval. So, so the size of the interval depends on, you know, the, the size of the, of the support of those uniform distributions that we're using for the initialization. Um, so, so that means that, you know, we can 
we can also plug that value of that zeta function explicitly. Um, right, so this is just illustrating um, maybe the case of the Gaussian initialization. Uh, the previous figure that I showed you was for a uniform initialization. And you know we observe the same kind of uh, situation um, here as before. And if we change the Gaussian initialization, maybe we use a sharp Gaussian initialization, we observe the same thing. But now you see that the solution is, is kind of sharper around the middle. So because this curvature penalty function is more highly peaked. And you know, and this is essentially you know the orange curve that we can compute in, in closed form. And you see that it kind of captures very well the, the solution of training the neural network. Uh, okay, so what can we do with this? Uh, well, uh, maybe one thing that you can try to do is that, uh, so with this bias description, we can try to formulate heuristics for parameter initialization, either to ease the optimization or also to induce specific smoothness priors on the solutions. So let's say that you know I wanted my solution to be very smooth in some part of the input space. So then I could try to cook up some parameter initialization procedure so that it will penalize uh, the curvature more strongly on that part of the input space. Or also, you know, if I knew that my data, for some reason I knew that I need a lot of curvature in some part of the input space in order to feed the data. So I could also try to initialize my parameters in such a way that you know, the neural network can more readily implement curvature in that part of the space. And so that, you know, maybe training will be faster. Actually, this is related to a very extensive experimental work by Ingo Steinbart, where he was asking the following question, you know, we're initializing almost always the bias and uh, why do we do that? Maybe it would be more beneficial to have all the breakpoints of the neural network at initialization be evenly distributed over the input space. And uh, he was able to show that actually, if you do that, the convergence is faster. Um, so, so that could be an approach to do that, maybe in a more way, depending on the data. So you can pre-sample the data and then you know, try to come up with a, a, a suitable uh, parameter initialization procedure. Anyway, so and the other thing, so because we can actually construct any curvature penalty function that we want. So if we are given some function that we like, maybe this rho as a density as a curvature penalty function that we want to implement, we can actually define a, a sampling procedure for the weights and biases, which will precisely uh, return that as the curvature penalty function. So, and uh, the way of doing this is it's not too difficult. So we just need to set uh, the, the density of the breakpoints, uh, which is very easy to, to obtain. And, uh, in a particular way, and, and we will obtain um, the you know the, the 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 equivalent of the curvature penalty function with this procedure and, and that function that we started with. Um, all right, so maybe the next step here is that maybe for those of you who are familiar with splines, uh, you, you will have recognized that that energy function that I showed to you is actually one of the ways of defining uh, cubic splines. So especially when the parameters are initialized uh, IID uniform on a finite interval, then zeta is constant. And um, when we have that, that problem, so this, this minimization problem, the second derivative squared dx, so fitting some data, maybe fx is equal to y, maybe yi. So this is a way of defining a cubic interpolating spline. Uh, with natural bound conditions. And for general zeta, um, we obtain something more, uh, more general that is called a space adaptive um, cubic spline, uh, which, you know, so of course the natural cubic spline, this is something that can be computed by solving a linear system. And this cubic spline can also be computed by solving a linear system. It depends a little bit on this function zeta, and you know, it may be useful just to discretize the input space and solve that um, that system in that discretized space. But you know, it can also be solved formally in the next case, uh, RKHS formalism. Uh, what is interesting about this, you know, the space of cubic splines is a linear space uh, whose dimension is of order m. So m is the number of data points. 
And uh, hence, in some sense, the effective capacity of the model is adapted to a size uh, M of the set independently of the number of parameters. Um, so can also use results on spline and approximation theory to make statements about the trained neural networks. So for instance, you know, if I know what is gonna be the nature of the solution function, and I know that it is gonna be a spline, then I can use uh, results on generalization for splines in order to make statements about the generalization properties of the trained neural networks. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so much for that. Then um, we can actually also discuss the training trajectories. Um, maybe, you know, if you think about uh, constraint optimization, one thing that people like to do, you can do is just relax those constraints. So our constraints are that we are requiring that the function fits the data, but we could say, you know, instead of fitting the data, we can just say, all right, so let's just have a, a penalty and we still might have energy, um, but, um, but we want now instead of being a, a constraint just to have um, maybe the square difference between um, the prediction and the, the, the output value of the data. And, and then we have maybe some, some trade-off between these two terms, uh, fitting the data versus minimizing that curvature. And um, you know, this is a, you know, it's a, um, we were to do that, um, you know, what, what is possible to, 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 to observe is that this actually gives an approximation of the solution function uh, when you do early stopping. So if you were to follow the gradient descent trajectory, for t steps, t iterations with a learning rate of this size, then the solution that you obtain is gonna be approximately equal to the solution of this problem. Um, this is something that you know, has appeared in, in some, you know, in a lot of works and in particular maybe um, in Chris Bishop's um, work from 95, uh, where he shows how early stopping um, can be, uh, Approximated uh, in a way by um, um, by having some uh, quadratic term added to the objective, which basically measures the distance from your initialization. So, and this is sort of what we are doing here. So, we, we still have here our minimization problem, and uh, and this penalty that is coming in there. Um, so, this means that we can sort of describe the trajectories in function space. Uh, this is a single illustration. So in the left uh, panel, you see some data points, maybe these ones here, and you see maybe in red are the, oh, I, I forgot to mention the solution to this problem is called a smoothing spline um, of the data. So we are no longer fitting the data, but we are kind of putting a curve that approximates the data, but uh, doesn't necessarily fit it. So in particular, so depending on this, um, a trade-off parameter, we may have um, a function that just cares about minimizing the curvature that could end up being just the linear, uh, 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 the linear regression of the data. Or if we kind of don't care uh, about this term, then we will end up just fitting the data. So depending on how we take these two limits, we're gonna recover the result that I showed you previously. So the, the, the span interpolation of the data, or we're gonna end up having here um, just a linear regression solution. And in between there is a, a whole family of trajectories uh, shown here in, in red. So we start with the zero function and eventually as we train, we end up fitting the data with this cubic spline. And in green, you see the, the, the neural network trajectory. So it's a little bit cluttered. So in the right panel with the two dimensional PCA, uh, representation of these trajectories in function space. So at initialization, both are the same. So that's this point here. And as we start training, kind of they are kind of moving around and eventually we converge at the end of training. Uh, that's for, uh, well, that's for the smoothing splines and the green one is for the neural networks. So, and you see that also the solutions are very close to each other because as described in the theorem, the difference between these two points in function space, this is gonna drop as one over square root n, so which can be very, very small. <clears throat> yeah, all, all right, so, so this is interesting because uh, you know, it allows us to maybe think about stopping and spectral bias. So 
maybe you know the train trajectory being approximated by a smoothing spline means that uh, the network is is kind of fitting first low frequencies or filtering out high frequencies and only fitting those high frequencies later on. So because if we have a smoother function, we'll have um, predominantly low frequencies rather than high frequencies. And this type of behavior is something that people have observed in a number of works and people refer to that as a spectral bias. So another perspective to, to think about this. Um, all right, so any, any comments um, until here? Okay, so then let me move on and uh, tell you. So in the result, I actually did a linear adjustment of the data. So I said that there existed these constants U and V that we added to the training data and only then, uh, you know, we started fitting and doing things. So this linear adjustment uh, simply accounts for the fact that you know, the characterization that we have is in terms of the second derivative. We're trying to characterize a function in terms of its second derivative, but obviously, you know, any two functions which only depend, uh, the differ on a linear function by a linear function, they will have the same second derivative. And so we cannot distinguish linear functions. And that's why we need to subtract that part from the characterization. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you were to try to fit a linear function with a neural network, uh, that only accounts for a tiny fraction of the norm of the parameters of the network. And that means that um, in a very specific way, um, you know, having to fit an additional linear part uh, doesn't really change the result. So, and you know, just to illustrate that, here is an, uh, you know, kind of an illustration where basically we consider extremely skewed data. That is, uh, you know, what we did was to take this same training example. We added a very tilted linear function, maybe with a very high slope, and then we trained for that. And uh, this this figure, we're actually subtracting again that linear function so that it fits here in the in the panel. Otherwise, you know, it would look like a curve that looks like that, so, you know. So, but, you know, we observe the same situation that you know, the solution is very well um, captured by the solution to that um, variational problem, even if we don't care about that linear adjustment of the data. Um, okay, so there's maybe a technical aspect. Okay, so then let me tell you a little bit about generalization. So what I have been telling you until now is uh, for one dimensional regress. And uh, so, but it's obviously also interesting to think about the multi-dimensional setting. And so this is the generalization. It's uh, in spirit very similar to the previous result, um, but we have a little bit more notation and technicalities. So now uh, we assume that the weights and biases are initialized from a sub uh, but now you know we have a, a vector of bias of, of weights and um, and the bias. And uh, otherwise, you know, we have similar definitions. We can also define something like a breakpoint, but this is now going to be um, uh, maybe a normal of the hyperplane that determines some kind of uh, activation um, locus for the ReLU. And uh, you know, similar, we do our linear adjustment of the data, and then the gradient descent optimization with um, um, the neural network and sufficiently small step size will converge to a parameter theta star, which attains zero training error. And moreover, we have this characterization of the bias. Um, as before, we have a function zeta that is determined by. Uh, the probability distribution uh, that we use to initialize the parameters. And we have that the solution of training is close to some G star uh, at most one over square root 10. And um, then we have that with high probability over the initialization, uh, you know, these two things are close to each other where uh, G star is the solution to a variational problem. Again, we, we have to fit the data. That's kind of a constraint. And we're minimizing some energy, which now is also weighted by the curvature penalty function. And it's a square of something. And that something corresponds basically to the second derivative, but now it's not the second derivative, but rather a uh, rather transform of um, fractional uh, negative Laplacian of the difference to initialization. Um, 
which you know corresponds basically to in the one-dimensional case to the to the square of the difference of the second derivative. Um, all right, so much for that. I see a question here. Do you know if this result generalized to leaky ReLU? Um, I uh, yes, I'm I'm going to mention uh, possible generaliz or further generalization. Uh, this one uh, generalization to other activation functions. So right, the results that I was showing were for the ReLU case, and uh, then um, but for different activation functions, we can we can also obtain a similar result. And the idea is as follows. So for the ReLU, uh, so you know, you saw that kind of this breakpoint was a kind of an important aspect of it. And so the location of that breakpoint, which determines like where can we implement some curvature. And, um, you know, but if you take, for example, now like derivative of, um, of this function, so what do you get? So you get something like something like this. So function that may kind of jump in there. So maybe here we get gradient zero and here we get uh, gradient one. And if you take the second derivative, you're gonna get um, a function that looks like, like a spike uh, with that uh, kind of spike sitting at the breakpoint. And actually it is this thing that is kind of relevant. And so we can try to generalize the discussion um, just using that property. And one way of doing that is to say that we consider phi, the activation function, to be what is known as a Green's function of some linear operator L. And that means that if we apply that operator to phi, we're going to get a, a spike, the Dirac delta. Uh, but this could be a different type of operator. Uh, not, not necessarily the second derivative, could be something else. And uh, then if we assume that the activation function is homogeneous of degree k, so meaning that we have a product like this, um, then we, we get a similar statement as before. So again, the training uh, on this linearly adjusted data gives us a, a zero training error and the solution actually solve uh, or is very well approximated by the solution to this variational problem where now we have substituted the second derivative by this uh, linear operator L, which could be the second derivative in the case of the values. And the curvature penalty function looks, looks also similar as before. Uh, so for the case of leaky relu, um, yeah. So I, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm confident that, that that this will work very similarly. Um, I haven't actually, uh, we haven't actually, you know, calculated this by hand or anything, but but it should actually follow from this. Um, yeah. So at least a, a close, a, you know, a similar form of it. So yeah. Um, all, all right. But it's a, it's a good, uh, good pointer. Uh, all right, so any other questions so far? Uh, how am I doing with the time? Um, I think I don't have so much time, uh, but I want to maybe comment briefly on related works and um, try to give you just a very brief overview of the, of the, uh, of the proof. Oh yeah, so there is a question for what kind of initializations will set up be close to constant. Oh yeah, so for example, for the, oops, for example, if you use uniform initialization, IID, it will be constant on an interval that is determined by the size of the interval that you use for the initialization. Uh, or also if you do binary uniform initialization of the parameters, you're gonna get a constant curvature penalty function. Um, on the range of, of, of parameters, um, on the range um, that contains the support of, of those probability distributions. Okay, yeah, welcome. Uh, so related works, as I said, you know, there has been so much work going on in uh, you know, optimization of neural networks and implicit biases. So, but I want to maybe highlight some of those works. I mean, this work of, of Jang et al. Uh, where they describe the implicit bias of gradient descent in the kernel regime as minimizing a kernel norm from initialization subject to fitting the training data. So that result um, is pretty similar to what we obtained here. Um, and as a matter of fact, we were able to show that these two things are equivalent. What's different is that uh, what we did was to make basically this kernel norm explicit. So describe what it looks like in function space. And so therefore we obtain a, an intuition for what it actually means 
um, this bias. And so this gives us an interpretable description of the bias in function space. And furthermore, we illustrated the role of the parameter initialization procedure. So kind of in determining where you are penalizing the curvature in, uh, in the input space. Uh, another interesting related work I already mentioned is uh, the work of Savarese, where they were looking at infinite width neural networks. Uh, and one implication of the result is that if you do two norm weight regularization, then the solutions will end up corresponding to um, to functions that minimize the one norm of the second derivative. So that would be something like this. Uh, whereas in our case, so we don't have explicit regularization of the weights. So we obtain um, a result um, of this form. So, and the square here is important. So an example of these are the linear splines and an example of these are the cubic splines or not an example. I mean, the solution these are cubic splines. The solution of this is not uniquely determined but an example are linear interpolating splines. So there have also been a couple of works that are kind of investigating or mm, this perspective, like this, this work by Pari and Novak, um, right? So you know, maybe in contrast, our result characterizes the solution of training from a given initialization without explicit regularization and turn out to be minimizing the weighted two norm of the second derivative. So, so that's an interesting contrast. Maybe another um, closely related work is that of William et al. Uh, from Bruna's, um, group uh, where they, uh, they showed a similar result for a univariate shallow uh, value network. Um, they focus on training the output layer from zero initialization. And also the work of Heiss et al, where they discuss which weight penalty and um, adaptive splines and early stopping but training only the output layer. Maybe in contrast, what we do here is that maybe, maybe the most substantial generalization is uh, the generalization to multivariate data uh, also different activation functions, the training trajectories. And moreover, we're actually training both layers. Uh, so the, 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 kind of the, the, kind of the input layer and the output layer. Uh, so what we do is to prove that training both layers can indeed be approximated by training only the output layer. And so and we also uh, allow for a general initialization. Um, okay, so much for that. Uh, now, you know, I don't know how much um, time I have. Um, so, if, you know, can, I can give you a super short overview of the proof strategy if you want, or just jump straight to the discussion. Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we might be short on time if we uh, go, get into the proof. So, uh, might be uh, better to jump to the discussion. All right. So, then uh, the discussion or conclusion is that, you know, I presented to you an explicit description of the implicit bias of grain descent uh, for mean square error regression with univariate white shallow value networks. And what it tells us is that the train network function interpolates the training data and up to a small error of one over square root n. Uh, inference from the initial function will have the smallest possible weight to norm of the second derivative. So, and the weight is going to be determined by the probability distribution that we use to initialize the parameters. Uh, moreover, we are actually also able to describe the trajectory in function space in terms of these um, smoothing splines. Um, as a matter of fact, these are spatially adapted uh, smoothing splines that end up converging to the interpolating splines. And um, we were able to generalize these results to multivariate uh, value. Um, uh, networks and uh, also certain families of activation functions. So with that, um, I conclude. So thank you so much for your attention and um, happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, Guido. I'm, I'm gonna stop the recording now and uh, we can take the questions after.